Hi, good afternoon and thank you for joining us today. My name is Anna, I work in Dr. Adekar's lab and I'm gonna be talking to you about what to do once you get your plasmid library. So the first thing that I'm gonna go over is the overview slide. So just so you know where we're at. So in this overview, uh, I am going to focus on amplifying your uh, synthesized library and how you can package it into virus. And I don't have calculators on any of my slides, but all of these can be bottlenecks. So you have to be paying attention to every step in this, uh, in this part of your experimental procedure. So the first thing that you do is you get your library. It's gonna be synthesized, so you're not gonna have a lot of it. Definitely not enough to screen. So the first thing we're going to do is transform it into bacteria. The bacteria will amplify it. We will grow the bacteria in solid phase, and we'll talk about why later. And then we will kill our friends that just made all these plasmid for us, and we'll harvest all of our library. And at this point, it's really a, a good idea to maybe sequence your library to make sure that you haven't lost any representation of your guides between getting it from your synthesis uh, aliquot to your amplified sample. The next thing you do is you take your library and you also have a couple of friends uh, you, you buy or you already have some viral packaging plasmids. You transfect those in combination to your cells that will produce virus. These cells will then give you virus. At this point, you have the option to concentrate your virus or just titer it as it comes out. And um, I highly recommend not only doing a qPCR-based titer of the virus that you get, but doing a functional titer in the cell line that you are planning to screen. So if you do a functional titer, say for example, in your 293T cells, your virus may look amazing, you may have super concentrated virus, but once you go into your cells of interest, these cells might be a little more finicky to work with, they might not take virus as well, so you may lose representation of your library at that step if you don't first functionally titer your virus in the cells that you will eventually be working on. And um, this is just a little representation of a little viral title experiment that I will be talking about more later. So where to get your library? Um, AdGene has, like Olivier showed you, 12 libraries for human and like eight for mouse and there's all kinds of amazing uh, libraries uh, that are in that repository. You can also have your library custom synthesized. Um, I think the smallest array that you could get is about 10,000 oligos. And it is really important that if you are synthesizing your own library that you include multiple guides for each one of the genes that you will be trying to knock out because in a perfect world, everything should work, but in our imperfect world, you might have a lot of guides that don't work, that don't do anything, so it's important to give yourself more than one shot when you're running these screens, right? And the reason why I have this slide up is because, uh, as Olivier mentioned in the first overview slide, you can either start with cell lines that you've already transduced with a Cas9 expressing vector, or you can have the all-in-one library, which would be the Lenti CRISPR v2, which contains your guide and your Cas9 in the same vector, so you only need to do one transduction for your cell lines to receive both the Cas9 and the guide that it will um, target your, your gene of interest. So always keep that in mind when you are ordering your libraries or when you are synthesizing them yourself. So once you get your precious aliquot, um, the first thing that's going to happen is you're gonna shove it into some bacteria. And the most efficient way or the most recommended way to do this is by electroporation. Now, you can work with your favorite bacteria. Uh, I work with uh, some electrocompetent cells from Lucigen and those have been giving me great results. If you have your favorite strain that has its own recovery media or you just have your lab's favorite strain that uses regular sock media, I do recommend that you follow whatever vendor's recovery media uh, recommends because for, in my personal experience, it, between my Lucigen specific recovery media or just regular sock media, there is a big difference in my transfection or in my transformation efficiency. So, Try to stick as much as you can to the optimal um, 
reagents that have already been found out for you in whatever vendors that you're relying on for acquiring your cells. Um, this is kind of, all of my slides are gonna be including catalog numbers and they might be a little number heavy. This is just for you guys to have as a reference. These slides, as, as Olivia mentioned, will be made available. So don't worry about catching all those right now um, or at all. <laughs> um, but for uh, transforming your, your bacteria, it also uh, depends on what equipment you have available to yourself. So here I have what I have available to me. We have this, um, this micro -rat micro -pulse or bio rat micropulsor electroporator at, in our lab. If you have a different brand or a different version of this, just look at the protocol for whatever component cells you've received, and it should tell you everything that, is, that has already been optimized for transformation of those cells. Also, when you are transforming these cells, you're gonna be transforming a lot of them, right? Make sure that you take a small portion of that to plate in a very dilute sample so that you're able to calculate your transformation efficiency. Depending on the size of your library, you're gonna want to meet a transformation efficiency that's higher than some number to make sure that you've maintained enough coverage of your library, right? What would happen if you have a low transformation efficiency? you would lose representation of your library. So you will already be starting with a library that is not the same as the one that you got, right? So what do we do next after we transform our cells? We will grow our cells on solid phase, not liquid phase. Why? Um, liquid phase can lead to some of your library being lost as your solution grows um, uh, saturated. So the way that we grow the, these cells and the way that it's recommended, at least by the CRISPR version two and Lentiguide Pure libraries is that you grow them in these very large, almost individual pizza size plates called bioassay plates, where you will have a surface area or a culture area of about 500 centimeters squared. You wanna add your agar with your ampicillin selection to make sure that the only bacteria that's growing there is your desired bacteria, your transformed bacteria. And then you will grow this overnight, invert it, and the next day you will maxi prep it, right? So growing it in this surface area will give you enough space for you to have enough amplification of your library and, um, and a high enough yield of your plasmid to be able to use that into your viral packaging uh, protocols later on. So for the libraries that you get, if you're working with the version two or with the Lenting Guide Pure library, those are typically split into two half libraries. So the version two library is roughly 120,000 elements big because there is about 20,000 genes and each one of those has six guides targeting each gene, right? So each half of the library is 60,000 elements big. So to be able to get all of those 60,000 elements in a fairly equal representation, you will be performing multiple transformations per half library, pulling them together or keeping them separately, depending on what it is that you need, and growing them together or separately in these solid phase bioassay plates. I've been told that there are these like semi-solid phase gels where you can grow bacteria and it leads to a lot higher yields or a lot more bacteria that you will get using just this basic solid agar uh, method. <laughs> um, I haven't personally tried it, but I do know that it exists and one of our sponsors outside is the one that carries that system in case you're interested or in case you foresee you yourself needing a lot of DNA for your libraries. Once you get your libraries um, into bacteria and once you uh, maxi prep your library so you recover your plasmid, I don't recommend um, storing any sort of glycerol stocks with your transformed library. If you do find yourself in need of more plasmid library, it's much more recommendable for you to re-transform bacteria, regrow your cultures, and then re-maxi prep so you have a fresh batch of plasmid available. And it's also always a good idea to submit your libraries for sequencing after you've amplified it to make sure that you haven't lost any coverage of your library at that step. Um, so this is a little heavy on the text. This is just for your future reference. 
like I mentioned, recovery medium, stick to the one that's your cell's favorite. Um, your transformation efficiency, it's going to be very important. Currently, we plate a 40,000 fold dilution on a 10 centimeter plate. And all you do with that plate is count the colonies that appear on it the next day. Um, you, will, you will need a dilution factor, or you will need a, uh, yes, you will need a dilution factor greater than 6 million, or you expect a transformation efficiency of greater than 6 million, right? So uh, after you have this number, if you find out that your transformation efficiency is too low, I recommend just starting it over again because you've already, at that point, you've already bottlenecked your library. So always try and shoot for a very high transformation efficiency. Um, the maxi prep kit that I use is column based. I get much better result using the column based maxi preps that I do using the Kaigen centrifugation kits. Um, if you are able to use these kits, they're also very time uh, very time efficient. You, I do highly recommend using the column-based purification. The only thing that you need to watch out for in, if you're using those kits is you don't want to load too much bacteria into your columns because then you'll have the problem of overloading your column and having terrible yields and basically having to repeat your entire transformation all over again. Uh, always sequence or highly recommended for you to sequence your library before you start screening with it. And also, try and do your best to preserve your plasmid library um, as much as possible. So if you find yourself not needing to use it for months and then you want to run another screen, it might be a good idea to just retransform your bacteria and work with a fresh batch of plasmid rather than a library that's been sitting at minus 20 that might already have started to degrade. Right? The next thing you do once you've uh, recovered your amplified library, and once you've sequenced it and you've determined that it's good to work with, is that you will package it into virus. And this can come in different flavors. There's a second generation system that uses two plasmids on, on top of the plasmid library that you'll be transfecting with, uh, with these viral packaging plasmids. So these are the two that I use, my envelope and my packaging plasmids. Co-transfect them with your library, and you'll let your cells do the work. You will then harvest your virus and concentrate it if you choose to. And the one thing that I do want to mention between the second generation and the third generation is that the third generation is safer to use. It might lead to slightly lower, tighter virus, which is important by the time you will be transfecting your cells. You want your, you want your virus tighter to be reliable or to be high enough for you to be able to do a complete screen. The second generation system uses only two vectors instead of three. It, it is a little more dangerous to use because there's a higher chance of these plasmids recombining to make the virus infectious again. So keep that in mind when you're working with these plasmids and always practice safe viral, uh, viral managing um, practices. So you will have your 293T cells. You will put your viral packaging and your envelope plasmids along with your library in. These are the uh, recommended amounts given by the Sang lab itself when they're transforming their whole genome libraries. You will throw them into some 293Ts. The 293Ts will then generate your virus. And then you will harvest your virus and do either a qPCR-based titer or a functional titer. I recommend both, and I do recommend that you do, for sure, a functional titer, especially in the cells that you will use. Um, some cells, you might find that you need to use double the amount of virus as opposed to having just trans, uh, titered your virus on 293Ts, or you might find that you might need less virus. So this is just a short example of uh, a functional titer. You basically, depending on what you're going to use, I use a luminometer or I use a, a plate reader. So I include all kinds of different controls. You'll need a no selection control to determine the amount of killing after you've added selection to your cells and, and determine the amount of cells that have survived after you have added virus and selected for those uh, cells that have gotten the virus. Um, the pyramidin control is basically cells that have not been transduced. You will finish your experiment when all of these wells are dead. You have a polyrene control to check for toxicity. Some cells can be very sensitive to polyrene. And uh, media only to subtract backgrounds. Just a very simple 
very easy play, uh, reader experiment. And then you have your varying amounts of virus. And essentially, what you want to see is um, more cells surviving the more virus you add to them. And you're going to be using this functional titer to calculate the multiplicity of infection of your virus. This is going to be important because for the CRISPR assays, you want to make sure that you infect your cells only at about 30 to 40% at most of your total cell population. And why? Because based on this multiplicity of infection, you're calculating how many of these viral particles are going to go into each of your cells. So you want to make sure that each one of your cells gets one viral particle with one guide. If you get more than one, you're going to have all kinds of convoluted results later on in your sequencing. So given this, this is just a short example. Eventually, you are going to get to a point where adding too much virus is going to kill your cells. So again, I cannot stress this more. Always tighter your virus on the cells that you will work with. And I promise you, it's going to save you a lot of headaches. And um, uh, also be wary of over, uh, over transducing your cells. So you want to make sure that by the time you start your screen, you've added the amount of virus necessary to have one particle of virus per cell. And that should give you about 60% killing after you add selection to your screen. Any questions? Yes, we want these plasmids to be integrated in the genome so that they can last for the duration of the screen. Um, T typically, these screens will run for several weeks, and just a, a regular transfection may lead to losing your, your plasmid. So if you lose your Cas9 or you lose your guide, it may affect your screen. Technically, the Cas9 should cut, and if, if recombination happens so that the wild type sequence uh, is recovered, it will cut again. So, Eventually, it will cut enough time until the point where the recombination gives you a sequence that no longer is a wild type. So I would say generally, I recommend using the virus so that you don't have to worry about maybe your plasmid being lost before your Cas9 could make that mutation permanent and, and not have your wild type sequence come back um, after the cut. So. Thanks, Anna. Yeah. Uh,